Chapter 15, Island of the Blue Dolphins. There have been wild dogs on the island of the Blue Dolphins as long as I remember. But after the Aleuts had slain most of the men of our tribe and their dogs had left to join the others, the pack became much bolder. It spent the nights running through the village and during the day was never far off. It was then that we made plans to get rid of them. But the ship came and everyone left Galast. I am sure that the new that the pack grew bolder because of their leader, the big one with the thick fur around his neck and the yellow eyes. I had never seen this dog before the Aleuts came, and no one else had. So he must have come with them and been left behind when they sailed away. He was much a much larger dog than any of ours, which, besides, have short hair and brown eyes. I was sure that he was an Aleut dog. Already I had killed four of the pack, but there were many left, more than in the beginning, for some had been born in the meantime. The young dogs were even wilder than the old ones. I first went to the hill near the cave when the pack was away and collected armloads of brush, which I placed near the mouth of their lair. Then I waited until the pack was in the cave. It went there early in the morning to sleep after it had spent the night prowling. I took with me the big bow and the five arrows and two of the spears. I went quietly circling around the mouth of the cave and came up to it from the side. There, I left all of my weapons except for one spear. I set fire to the brush and pushed it into the cave. If the wild dogs heard me, there was no sound from them. Nearby was a ledge of rock, which I climbed, taking my weapons with me. The fire burned high. Some of the smoke trailed out over the hill, but much of it stayed in the cave. Soon the pack would have to leave. I did not hope to kill more than five of them, because I had only that many arrows. But if the leader was one of the five, I would be satisfied. It might be wiser if I waited and saved all my arrows for him, and this I decided to do. None of the dogs appeared before the fire died. Then three ran out and away. Seven more followed, and a long time afterwards, a like number. There were many more still left in the cave. The leader came next. Until the others, he did not run away. He jumped over the ashes and stood at the mouth of the cave, sniffing the air. I was so close to him that I could see his nose quivering, but he did not see me until I raised my bow. Fortunately, I did not frighten him. He stood facing me, his front legs spread as if he were ready to spring, his yellow eyes narrowed to slits. The arrow struck him in the chest. He turned away from me took one step and fell. I sent another arrow towards him, which went wide. At this time, three more dogs trotted out of, out of the cave. I used the last of my arrows and killed two of them. Carrying both of the spears, I climbed down from the ledge and went through the brush to the place where the leader had fallen. He was not there. While I was being... While I had been shooting at the other dogs, he had gone. He could not have gone far because of his wound. But though I looked everywhere around the ledge where I had been standing and in front of the cave, I did not find him. I waited for a long time, then went inside the cave. It was deep, but I could, could, clear, could see clearly. Far back in the corner was the half-eaten carcass of a fox. Beside it was a black dog with four gray pups. One of the pups came slowly towards me, a round ball of fur that I could have held in my hand. 
I wanted to hold it, but the mother leaped to her feet and bared teeth. I raised my spear as I backed out of the cave, yet I did not use it. The wounded leader was not there. Night was coming, and I left the cave, going along the foot of the hill that led to the cave. I had not gone far on this trail that the wild dogs used when I saw the broken shaft of an arrow. It had been gnawed off near the tip, and I knew it was from the arrow which had wounded the leader. Far on, I saw his tracks in the dust. They were uneven as if he were traveling slowly. I followed them towards the cliff, but finally lost them in the darkness. The next day and the next it rained and I did not go to look for him. I spent those days making more arrows and on the third day with those arrows and my spear, I went out along the trail the wild dogs had made and from my house. There were no tracks after the rain, but I followed the trail to the pile of rocks where I had been there, then where I had seen them. On the far side of the rocks, I found the big gray dog. He had the broken arrow in his chest, and he was laying with one of his legs under him. He was about ten paces from me, so I could see him clearly. I was sure that he was dead, but I lifted the spear and took good aim at him. Just as I was about to throw the spear, he raised his head a little from the earth and then let it drop. This surprised me greatly, and I stood there for a while, not knowing what to do, whether to use the spear or my bow. I was used to animals playing dead until they suddenly turned on you and ran away. The spear was the better of the two weapons at the distance, but I could not use it as well as the others. So I climbed onto the rocks where I could see him if he ran. I placed my feet carefully. I had a second arrow ready to shoot, ready should I need it. I fitted an arrow and pulled back the string, aiming at his head. Why did I not send the arrow? I cannot say. I stood on the rock with the bow pulled back and my hand would not let it go. The big dog lay there and did not move. And this may be the reason. If he had gotten up, I would have killed him. I stood there for a long time looking down at him and then I climbed off the rocks. He did not move when I went to him, nor could I see him breathing until I was very close. The head of the arrow was in his chest and the broken shaft covered with blood. The thick fur around his neck was matted from the rain. I do not think that he knew I was picking him up, for his body was limp as if he were dead. He was very heavy, and the only way I could lift him was by kneeling and putting his legs around my shoulders. In this manner, stopping to rest when I was tired, I carried him to the headland. I could not get through the opening under the fence, so I cut the bindings and lifted out two of the whale ribs, and thus took him into the house. He did not look at me or raise his head when I laid him on the floor, but his mouth was open and he was breathing. The arrow had a small point which was fortunate and came out easily, though it had gone deep. I did not move. He did not move while I did this, not afterwards as I cleaned the wounds with a peeled stick from a coral brush. This brush was has poisonous berries, yet its wood often heals wounds that nothing else will. I had not gathered food for many days, and the baskets were empty, so I left water for the dog, and after mending the fence, went down to the sea. I had no thought that he would live 
and I did not care. All day, I was among the rocks, gathering shellfish, and only once did I think about the wounded dog, my enemy, laying there in my house, and then to wonder why I had not killed him. He was still alive when I got back, though. He had not moved from the place where I had left him. Again, I cleaned the wound with a coral twig. I then lifted his head and put water in his mouth, which he swallowed. This was the first time that he had looked at me since the time I had found him on the trail. His eyes were sunken, and they looked out at me from far back in his head. Before I went to sleep, I gave him more water. In the morning, I left food for him. When I went down to the sea, and when I came home, he had eaten it. He was lying in the corner, watching me. While I made a fire and cooked my supper, he watched me. His yellow eyes followed me wherever I moved. That night, I slept on the rock, for I was afraid of him. And at dawn, I went out. I left the hole under the fence open so he could go. But he was there when I got back, laying in the sun with his head on his paws. I had speared two fish, which I cooked for my supper. Since he was very thin, I gave him one of them. And after he had eaten it, he came over and laid down by the fire, watching me with his yellow eyes that were narrow and slanted up at the corners. Four nights I slept on the rock, and every morning I left the hole under the fence open so he could leave. Each day I speared a fish for him, and when I got home he was always at the fence waiting for it. He would not take the fish from me, so I had to put it on the ground. Once I held out my hand to him, but at this he backed away and showed his teeth. On the fourth day, when I came back from the rocks early, he was not there at the fence waiting. A strange feeling came over me. Always before, when I returned, I had hoped that he w had gone. But now, as I crawled under the fence, I did not feel the same. I called out, dog, dog, for I had no other name for him. I ran for the house, calling it. He was inside. He was just getting to his feet, stretching himself and yawning. He looked first at the fish I carried and then at me and moved his tail. That night I stayed in the house. Before I fell asleep, I thought of a name for him, for I could not call him Dog. The name I thought of was Rontu, which means in our eyes, in our language, fox eyes. Okay, today I will fax over chapters 13 through 15, a quick write, some multiple choice, sequencing, and main idea paper. Also, some comprehension and analysis questions for you on 13 through 15. And some vocabulary for you. Now, it says use a dictionary, but you may use a tablet or your computer to find the um, meaning of these words. And on the last one, it says, on the lines below, write some quotes from the text that show how Karina feels through these chapters. You may pick any quotes you'd like. Thank you.